or around the beginning, I pray for a word or words for the year. The word may concern the world, America, us as a people, as a ministry, or each individually. And that's what I'm going to open now. But I first need to tell you what I found out when I went over the word that I gave or the words that I gave a year ago in January. First, it was during that service that I asked you to pray. I first got the news just before, a day before the service of last year's words for the year, that I have confirmation that I was to speak at the presidential inaugural prayer breakfast. Well, it turned out that the event took place exactly one year ago this weekend, and what I shared at that event turned out to be prophetic in light of what would take place in the year that just ended. I've never played the clip, a clip to you from that event, except I just, on Friday, played this clip. It's a very short clip. Um, so I've never shared from that inaugural prayer breakfast, which was this last year. And so it's important because it would link up with also with what would happen as well this past year. Because I was led to focus on one particular subject. At one point, I was addressing the outgoing administration, and I spoke about one subject at that point. And so this is what it is. If you have that ready, play the clip. It's one minute. You took part in isolating, condemning Israel before the world and advancing a resolution proclaiming Israel had no right to Jerusalem. If one has ever read the Bible, how could one foster such a thing? Did you miss what the Word of God says concerning Jerusalem? There is only one who has authority over Jerusalem. And it is not the United Nations. It is not the European Union. It is not you. There is only one, and his name is the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Holy One of Israel. Long before there was the United Nations or United States or any of the nations that cast this vote, the Lord issued his own resolution concerning Jerusalem. And no law, no executive order, no UN vote will ever overturn it. And concerning that UN resolution, the Almighty has issued his own response. He vetoes it. I was led to speak of Jerusalem. 2017 would turn out to be the year of Jerusalem. I spoke of the world's rejection of Jerusalem as the possession and capital of Israel. 2017, beyond all years, would be the center, the central issue at the end would be Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. I spoke of the UN rejecting it, and this would be the year also when the UN, after the proclamation that the president gave, rejected it. I spoke of God overriding the nation's, the nation's rejection of Jerusalem, and that's exactly what happened at the close of the year through the president when Donald Trump made that declaration. But as I look back, I realize it wasn't just that. But the words itself that I shared as the words for the year after I was praying would speak as well, would touch on those things before they happen. And I'm not saying it's always going to be like that, but that's what it was. I said this a year ago. I said, now I'm going to share a series of words that form a consistent word for this year. And I said, none of these came to me because I was looking for it or by my influencing it, but I, I said, it's amazing how consistent these are. And I said, I believe this now concerns the bigger picture. In other words, the world. Then I began sharing it. And what I shared last year were scriptures concerning a leader, a king in the Bible, who had his own agenda, but who would be used for the agenda of God to accomplish God's will, even though the king didn't necessarily know God. And I spoke of Trump. And I went on with the king from Scripture, giving the word I received. The king, this is what I shared, would issue a historic declaration. Before the year would be over, the leader of America would issue an historic declaration. <clears throat> the declaration of the king in Scripture would concern the Jewish people. The declaration of the president would concern the Jewish people. 
The declaration of the king in Scripture would concern their dwelling in the land of Israel after their exile. So too with the declaration of Donald Trump that just happened in December. And the declaration of the ancient king in the word that I shared a year ago specifically concerned the city of Jerusalem. The declaration that came about would specifically concern the city of Jerusalem. Recognizing Jerusalem, actually the, the declaration of the ancient king would actually by implication recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and that's exactly what happened. And in the Bible it would lead ultimately to the rebuilding of the temple. Well with the modern declaration we shall see. But the scripture I gave was all about that. It actually wasn't just one. It was a series, again, of several that kept pointing to that. And I also spoke of the nations, one other scripture, trying to stop this or coming against it. And that's also what happened after he gave that declaration. Now, the ancient kings I spoke of, actually I spoke of two, because the one is speaking about the other, Darius and Cyrus. What they did opened the door for God's purposes to be accomplished through His people. Trump's declaration went to the same purpose. We know that end time prophecy focuses on Jerusalem. Requires the Jewish people to be there. And have sovereignty over it. And the nations to rage against it. That's all an end time prophecy. And at the same time, Trump, and it's not about him, and it's not about endorsing everything, we know that. But he was used to open a window, not only for these purposes with Israel, but also to keep a window open. For the people of God in America. The phenomenon, they're linked to each other because what happens in Israel is linked to God's people everywhere. You are, if you are born again, you are the spiritual children of Israel. And that they are the physical children of Israel. And they are joined together. And if there's an increase of authority given to the Jewish people over their inheritance, Jerusalem, then there is an increase in spiritual authority to be given to the spiritual people of God. If the people of Israel have been given an open door to take their inheritance and move forward with God's purposes, Jerusalem, then believers are also being given an open door to take our inheritance to move forward in the purposes of God. What happens in Israel affects what happens in the church. And if the Israelis are rebuilding what they once had 2,000 years ago, then believers are to be rebuilding what they had, what the church had 2,000 years ago, as in the book of Acts. The church in its original form. We are to make the most of this hour and move forward with authority and confidence. I mean, you saw, I don't know how you felt when you, you heard that proclamation that day, but that was authority. That was a, a, a signal to move ahead in confidence. Your God lives. And in that, I will share these words. Because it's interesting, at least two of the words I will share that I prayed for this year appears to be a sequel from that which was last year, but I didn't seek that. But I will also share other words, some personally, some for you personally, some for the larger realm. And they may, some may stand on their own, some may relate to the others. What joins them together is simply that that's what I got when I pray. But I believe appointed for the year, and I believe there's an anointing on the words that for this year that if you apply them, there's an extra anointing because there's a time and place as well for the Word of God. Now the first one I'm going to share is from Matthew 25. First word, 14 to 30. I will not read it all here for the sake of time. But it's the parable of the talents. Man goes on a journey, entrusts his servants with money, talents. And each invests what he has and gains more for the master except one of them who doesn't want to give anything away and so he hides it away. And so those who invested and gave away the talents and got more for the master are rewarded. The one who tried to hoard it is taken to punishment. The parable of the talents, that's the reason why we use the word talent in English. To speak of a gift that you've been given. 
and entrusted. It actually comes from this parable. That's why we say, we say talent is a gift, because it comes from this parable. Because the money it speaks of a talent had nothing to do with that. A talent, a talenton, was a form of money. So we get the word talent, something God entrusts to you. But so it doesn't just mean your talents, it means your abilities, God, your strength, your gifts, yes, but your resources, that's what God gave you, your possessions, your, oppor your opportunities, your time, your energy, your strength, your life. All these things are gifts from God. And what it's saying is you need to use everything you have for God in the time you have. You can't just hoard it, you can't just keep it to yourself, you can't just use it for yourself, or do nothing with it. You can't just hang around, you have to use what God gave you for the purposes of God, everything. If you don't, then you lose it at the end. But if you do, you have eternal reward. So what you do for God is multiplied for God. And I believe God is telling us this year we are to use everything we have in the time we have, our talents, our gifts, our resources, all the more for the purposes of God, the kingdom of God. Commit what you have all the more to give to God, invest in God, your time, your resources, your talents, your abilities. It matches the scripture as well that says, He who sows generously will reap generously. He who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. You want to reap abundantly this year? Sow abundantly this year. And this, speaking of this, three words that I won't go into for time because I want to get into some other things, but take it as the commandment from God because it is. And it, but also, there's an appointing even more for this year. Mark 16, 15, and Matthew 28. Go into all the world, preach the gospel, the good news to all creation. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all that I command you, and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is not the great suggestion. This is called the great commission. Meaning He committed it to us. It is not that is for just some believers, those who are evangelists. It is for all believers. If you are a disciple, it is for you. It's a command. Don't argue with it. Just do it. Start spreading the word of salvation to everyone in your life who needs to hear it. Now, however you do it, do it. The cashier, the relative, the person you meet on the street, your friends, your loved ones, do it. I spoke on Friday. That even though there's been a political change, there has not yet been any real, major, noticeable, spiritual, or moral change um, in the nation of America as a whole. What we have now is a window of time in which to pray for, minister for, and work for revival. Right now the nation's culture is at war. Darkness warring against light with a vengeance. It's even more polarized than it has ever been. The president, and again, it's not the man, it's despite the man in many ways, but also the president has been used to protect the life of the unborn. He has acted from day one. One year ago, he, his first executive orders were to protect the unborn. He has acted for religious freedom. He's acted for Israel, Jerusalem, for believers. And at the same time, the mainstream culture is, is raging. America's apostasy and dissent from God has not stopped. Even now, there are cases at the Supreme Court right now which could gigantically threaten your religious liberty. And what happens in the next election, in the midterm, is also going to affect that. There is a war. I'll speak more about that. But I also got this scripture in the midst of all this, in the midst of what we have to stand for. The scripture I got was, Blessed is the one who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, does not stand in the path of sinners, nor doesn't sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by rivers of water that bring forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. 
What it, this is saying is no matter what's going on in the world, no matter what's going on in the culture, what's going on in your life around you, this is speaking of unconditional fruitfulness. No matter what's happening, God wants you to be unconditionally fruitful this year. How? By becoming first all the more separate, plugged out of those things that are corrupt in the culture, the ways of sin, the ways of the enemy. Even plugged out of the problems around you. Meaning, meaning what's happening, you're not so wrapped up in everything that's happening. But by becoming all the more plugged into God. And the things of God. Yes, we are to be aware. We are to act on the stage. I'm going to talk about that. But first, we have to be plugged into God. To get all the more plugged into the presence of God. All the more plugged into the Word of God this year. All the more plugged into the Spirit of God. All the more plugged out of worrying about yourself. And all the more plugged into the answer. And your life will bear fruit in every season, every circumstance. When you become as a tree planted by, rooted in, receiving from, plugged into the waters of God. And another scripture I got that connects in, a, in a, another way. I'm not trying, I wasn't trying to connect it, but it's what I got. Which is from the Song of Solomon. 1, verse 1. Let him kiss me. With the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. And then verse 4, take me with you. Let us hurry. The king has brought me into his chambers. God is calling us in the midst of everything that's going around to go deeper in him. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. I've shared with you in Greek, the word for worship is proskuneo, which means literally to kiss. God is calling you deeper this year into His presence. This year, deeper to go deeper into worship. Deeper into kissing God in the Spirit. Deeper into letting Him kiss you in the Spirit. To go deeper into the King's chamber, the Holy of Holies. Make it your aim to go deeper this year in intimacy with God in the secret place. It will keep you full of blessings in all seasons, all circumstances, no matter what goes on around you. The more that goes on around you, the more you got to strengthen what's going on within you. And speaking of blessings and God's presence, I got this, which you always hear because I give it every single week, but the first time I got it as a word for the year, which is this from the book of Numbers. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you His shalom. The blessing of God. This is a blessing. This is a prayer that was written by God Himself. And it's God's will for your life this year is blessing in this way. To be blessed, to be kept by God, to have the grace of God, to have His shalom. The, pre the God's will for your life is blessing we need it but god wants us to have to be blessing there's two parts to a blessing one is the one who gives the blessing the other is receiving the blessing if he you're blessed but you don't receive the blessing you don't get blessed let him bless you let him meaning let him cause his face to shine upon your life this year he shone upon moses and the face of moses was lit up the implication is god's face shining on your face and for that to happen, to have God's face shine on your face, you have to be facing God. If you're not facing God, you don't get any of the blessing. It says, I got, you know, whose mind is fixed upon thee, he will keep in perfect peace. God wants to shine on your face, but your face has to be more tuned to his face. The word in Hebrew for face, panim. Say it, panim. It means face, but it also means presence. The, blessing is, the blessings of God are face to face. And the blessing means also presence to presence. So to receive the more blessings from God this year, you have to be face to face. And you have to, you have to or in Hebrew, you have to be presence to presence. In other words, you have to be present in the presence. Your presence has to be in His presence to be blessed. This year, make it your goal to be more present in the presence of the presence of God. Face to face. And the blessings will be there. And it leads to another scripture I got for this year. Habakkuk 3 says this. 19. 
The Lord God is my strength, and He has made my feet to be like hinds feet, and He makes me to walk on high places. Now the preceding verse before this is all that's not there, though there's not fruit, there's not blossoming all around you, things are failing. But it's again a scripture of unconditional blessing. No matter what happens around you, no matter what happens in the world, the Lord God is your strength and in that He will make your feet like hinds feet. What does that mean? It's the hinds feet, that's the feet that dwells on the mountain on the highest places. Strong feet. This year, you know, it's sure, it's, it's strong and sure feet. God wants us more. God wants you more dwelling on the high places. God wants us to go higher. Higher ground. He wants you to go higher than before. Go upward. And to believe you can go to the next level. A higher walk, a higher race, a higher path, a higher life. To dare to believe you can go higher than you were before. You are not going to be stuck where you were with those issues that you've been dwelling on in. He wants you to dwell above them. Don't let your feet walk on the low ground this year. Don't walk on the same ground this year. Don't walk on the muddy ground this year. Prepare your feet to dwell on the high places this year. Now to a more bigger, a wide picture, prophetic realm. And these words that I didn't plan it, but now what I'm going to share with you continues on the words that I got last year concerning the world. The king issuing that declaration concerning Israel and the Jewish people. And specifically the city of Jerusalem. And so it happened. The word concerning Jerusalem. Now this is what I got without trying to get it. Ezra 6. Then because of the decree, it's like takes off where the last one left off. King Darius had sent Tatanai, governor of Trans-Euphrates and Shethar, Bozanai and their associates carried it out with diligence. So the elders of the Jews continued to build and prosper under the preaching of Haggai, the prophet, and Zechariah, the descendant of Edu. They finished building the temple according to the command of the God of Israel and the decree of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, kings of Persia. The temple was completed on the third day of the month of Adar in the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. Then the people of Israel, the priests, the Levites, the rest of the exiles, celebrated the dedication of the house of God with joy. Last year, literally, the declaration went forth from the most powerful man in the world concerning Jerusalem, just like in the Bible. This year the word I got is completion of purposes begun. Now I don't know specifically if it relates to Jerusalem or not, Interesting, because just this week the president said the building or the relocating of the American embassy to Jerusalem will not, is not going to take place as originally planned over, over several years. He's ordered to speed it up so that it happens next year. But when things happen in Israel, things happen are linked to the Spirit with us, with the church. Here's the spiritual realm. God makes decrees. He set things in motion for the world, for the nation, for us, for you. And what God decrees, He aims to fulfill. What God begins, God will bring to completion. He is the author and the finisher of your faith. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to bring it to completion. What God has purposed, He plans to complete. What God has purposed in the world, what God has purposed in your life, he aims to complete in your life. What God has fall, call, He's called forth to you, He means to be done. There may be things that have begun in your life last year that are to be completed this year. There may be other things God called forth, maybe for some time, many, many years, maybe many years in your life, intended for some time. God wants to do it now. He wants to complete it now in your life. A promise, a calling a ministry, a need, the purposes of God concerning your life. God wants to bring this ahead to fruition. As Trump says, I want these things speeded up, God wants these things speeded up in your life. Maybe it's been something you're waiting on that is of God, praying for. Maybe it's something you've delayed 
or avoided or have not responded to the voice of God. God wants it completed. God wants it moving ahead faster this year and completed. But you have a part in the completion. Just as the temple was the plan of God, and it was God's decree, but it had to be completed through the people. And they hindered, it had been hindered by other people, it had been hindered by circumstance, but they also were part of the problem. They delayed it too. They gave up on it. God wants you not to give up on the purposes of God for your life. Maybe they've been hindered. Maybe, they, maybe there's been circumstance. The, court, the enemy's always trying to stop it. But God wants it to move ahead now. He wants it completed through you. And that goes with another scripture that I did not plan together, but it's from the same exact situation in the Bible. I got it about a month ago. I shared as part, but I got it again now. Zechariah 4. Listen. So he said to me, verse 6, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, the guy who was there building the temple in the other books. Not by might, not by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord Almighty. What are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel you shall become a level plain. Then he will bring about the capstone with shouts of God bless it, or grace, grace. Then the word of the Lord came to me. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands will also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. This is the same temple from Ezra, same temple appointed by the king, decreed but called forth by God and hindered in the world, hindered by the enemy. But this now he's saying to the discouraged people, but now it will be completed, but it will not be by might or power, but by the Spirit of God. Yet it will be through God's people. Zerubbabel will build it. The Zerubbabel and the remnant had a work. They had to fight for the work. They had to persevere for the work. They had to press on in the work. They had to be encouraged in the work. But it was the Spirit of God in their working that would do the temple. God's Spirit encouraged them, quickened them to get up again. Some of you may have stopped what God has been calling in your life. You gave up on God saying, get up. I will anoint you, but get up. It says they rose up, they set their hands to the work God called them to. They had grown dormant. God is calling you to fulfill the calling with which He called you. Finish what He began. Get back to what was delayed but is of God. Move forward. The cornerstone that was laid must be answered by the capstone. What was begun must be finished. And that means you've got to get up, rise up, Set your hands to the work. Press on. Don't give up. Persevere. And do it all by the Spirit of God. And God will do it in you. And say to that mountain, Be thou removed. For He called you, and it is you who must lay the capstone with shouts of grace. Now I'm going to throw this one out. I don't mean throw it out. I'm going to put it out. I'm not going to get into it for time. I'm not going to say how it relates to anything, Israel or our lives. I have no idea. But I'm simply saying that I also got more than once Jeremiah 30 and 31, which is about the return, the restoration of the people of God, of Israel returning. I'm not going into it, but those are other scriptures I got. Now I want to get to the central word, the final word, but the central one. I'm going to present it to you in a way that I have not presented a word before. Or kind of, I'm going to present it kind of backwards in how it came to me. This week I knew I had to receive, I had to pray for the words for the year. And I was ministering in Illinois and a man comes up to me and gives me a coin. A special coin and on the coin is a scripture. I see the scripture and I said, whoa. And I, did, I covered this up just so I could reveal it at the time in the message. So this is what he gave me. Gives me this coin. Scripture on it, made of metal, words engraved. And the thing is, it was the same scripture that I got just before. 
Because before this, within a few weeks before, somebody gives me another object. It's this. It's a cube. And the cube has a scripture on it. Same scripture as this. Both engraved in metal. Both the exact same verse on it. I will tell you in a moment. But before I got this, I got something else. Somebody gave me a gift. And it was this. Metal. Engraved with a scripture. Same exact scripture. So, I mean, I, I don't usually get scriptures in metal. And the same one, it says, the Bible says, two or three witnesses. It got a, got a coin or a medallion, got a cube, and got, a, got this. And what is it? The scripture on each of them is this. Put on the full armor of God. So that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. The medallion has the scripture around it on each, and here it has here it has all the things that you put on and it has the, in the middle, you couldn't see it, but is the armor of God. The cube on each side has, this is a shield, a helmet, a breastplate, all these. That's what the six sides of the cube are. And this, the full armor of God, the helmet, the breastplate, the belt, the shoes, the sword, and the shield is the whole thing. Put on the full armor of God. I think God knows how to make a point. God knows how to get things across. You could be very dense. I could be dense, but it's hard to ignore this. We can't ignore it. This is going to follow what I shared on Friday night. Let me read the entire passage. Finally, Ephesians 6. Finally, be strong in the Lord. And in the power of His might, put on the full armor of God, so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the, of the enemy. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God, so that you'll be able to resist in the day of evil. Having done all, stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, take up the shield of faith, by which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. And pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought. Now, it may not be the scripture I would have chosen, but I'm not choosing it. Because it implies a fight. Warfare. And who wants warfare? But I got it three times in metal. The scripture is one of great power. Of great encouragement. The fight is there anyway. You can't avoid the fight. Problems, you can't avoid them. Conflict, challenges, it's part of life. It's part of being in the kingdom. It's even part of being outside the kingdom. Except that you're on the wrong side. But you are on the right side. And in the big picture, the times in which we live, morality, culturally, socially, spiritually, the fight is in full force, people of God. 
even with the reprieve we have for the moment, the fight against the ways of God is at full throttle. The fight over religious freedom, over morality, over marriage, over gender, over Israel, over Jerusalem, over the gospel is raging. If we don't fight, we're saying yes to evil. If we don't fight, we're saying yes to bondage. If we don't fight, we're saying yes to defeat. If the light does not fight, it's giving the victory to the darkness. Not only culturally, not only in the society, but personally in your life. You've got an enemy. You have to fight. If you don't fight, you're giving him free reign to hinder you, to enslave you, to keep you in bondage, to paralyze you, to keep you in fear. A slave is not a fighter. A fighter is not a slave. If you don't fight, you become a slave. If you fight, you're free. I mean, even, even armies that went down fighting, they went down free. You have a fight, you have an enemy. But you've been given, look what this is saying, you've been given power upon power upon power to stop him from winning and to enable you to have victory. But you have to fight. As I shared on Friday, don't fear the fight. I didn't share this scripture, but I shared what I had for the rest. Don't fear this fight. Don't be intimidated by the fight. Never give up. Embrace the fight. Get into the fight. Believers want to live a victorious life. You want, to live, you want a victorious life, you cannot live. It is impossible to live a victorious life unless you have a fight to have victory over. The only way to have a victorious life is to embrace the fight. Fight the fight by the power of God. Just a few days ago, we got hit with a kind of crazy attack in the bureaucratic realm, but crazy. And I'm dwelling on this thing, how to, or on this issue. How, to, how do we deal with this? And it, hit, it hits me, it concerns the exact, the attack concerned the exact area that we prayed to move forward in to higher ground this year. And I thought, of course, of course it is. The enemy attacks the very same area that you are called to advance in and to have victory in. When the enemy attacks, don't get discouraged because there's a reason for the attack. It'll all, the attack will often be a clue to the area that you are to have victory in. That you are to actually advance in. I mean, come on, think about warfare. Of course, the enemy attacks where he knows the, the troops that are, gonna, that are gonna bring victory to the other side. Of course he does. So when the enemy attacks, take it as a sign. And often the area that he's attacking is the area that you're to have actual, not defeat, but more victory in. The most famous battle of the Civil War was the Battle of Gettysburg. In that battle, a college president who had joined the Union Army named Joshua Chamberlain, with his men, took a little hill called Little Round Top. It was one of the most crucial sites of the battle, if not the most crucial. If the Confederate Army could take it, they could have changed the entire outcome of the battle. It was the high ground. And they came to take it. They came in waves, and Chamberlain and his men found themselves outnumbered, outmanned, and they were down. Their ammunition was running all out. It was virtually finished. It was certain defeat. A massacre was waiting to happen. But then Chamberlain did something that surprised everybody. He ordered his men, who were running out of their ammunition, without ammunition, to begin running down the mountain with empty guns screaming shouting shouts of victory they start running down the mountain without ammunition nothing it's all a bluff and the enemy goes into confusion and without ammunition they win the victory they decided to do something unthinkable to turn the enemy's attack around from defeat to victory You've got to do the same thing, people of God. The area that the enemy is attacking you in is the area not only you are not to retreat in, but you are to take the fight in, not just defend, but actually advance in it. 
Take new ground in it. Have breakthrough in it. So when it happens, don't panic. Don't fear. Don't get discouraged. You are more than a conqueror. Turn it around. I remember when the town, when we lost the vote and it was all over on the building and we were so discouraged, but then just something welled up in me. It had no reason. It had no earthly reason at all because we were told it was impossible from now on. And it just said, no, we are going to fight. This is the enemy and we're fighting. And God gave us the victory. You know, we just saw a, a film on Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill, you know, you know, England was, was, was being overwhelmed. Hitler took the whole continent of Europe. It was hopeless. The entire, the entire English army was going to be wiped out. They were, every nation had fallen. Not one nation had stood within months. Everything fell. And it was hopeless for England. And they were telling Churchill, but if you do that, what's going to happen is Hitler's going to take the island. And Churchill said, no, no matter what, even if we go down fighting, we're fighting. Because we are not giving in to evil. And because of that, if he had given in, if he had not fought, if that one man and, and had not stood, all history could have been changed. And if they had not fought, they would have been enslaved. So it is in your life. If you don't fight, you're accepting it. Don't accept what the enemy has done. Don't accept what the enemy has given as his terms. Don't accept it. You have, you're going to be used in great and mighty ways. You have to take up the fight. You've got to prepare for the fight. You've got to have a fighting spirit. It's a good fight. It's the fight that God's people always have to take up. Abraham had to take up the fight of faith in order to enter the promises. Jacob had to wrestle with the angel in order to receive the blessing. Joseph had to fight the fight of hope against discouragement to fulfill the calling on his life. Moses had to fight the fight against slavery in Egypt to lead the people to freedom against high powers. Joshua and his generation had to fight the giants in the land in order to take the promised land. Gideon had to fight the Midianites all against all odds. Elijah had to fight a kingdom of evil to see the miracle of God and the fulfillment of his calling. David had to fight Goliath against all odds to become king. The Maccabees had to fight against overwhelming odds to drive out evil from the land and restore the nation to God. The disciples had to fight against the odds of the Roman Empire to fulfill the Great Commission, but they did and they changed the world. If any of these had not fought the fight, they would not have won. They would not have entered in. They would not have overcome. They would not have received. They would not be free. And you never would have heard of them. Do not fear the fight, people of God. Do not fear the problem. Do not fear the challenge. Do not fear the enemy. Every fight, every problem, every challenge will be a doorway to a victory, to a miracle, and an inheritance in your life. See it that way now. You're a fighter. You're not a conqueror. You're more than a conqueror. Take up the fight. Don't accept the bondage. Fight the fight. Don't accept the sin in your life. Fight the fight. Don't accept the enemy's attack on your walk. Fight for your walk. Fight for your calling. Don't accept the enemy's attack on your family, on your marriage. Fight for it. Don't accept any evil. Fight for it. And never give up. Don't take it anymore. You're not a slave. Fight. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the full armor of God, man of God, woman of God. Put on the full armor. Gird up your belt of truth. Fasten your breastplate of righteousness. Tie up your sandals of God's will. Strap up your helmet of salvation. Lift up your shield of faith. Take up your sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. For the fight is for your sake, for your calling, and for your blessing. And if you fight the good fight this year, you will have victory this year. For you have been appointed for nothing less than victory. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Father, we praise you right now. And we thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for your words, Lord. And Lord, we want to take this now. We want to take this and we want to be anointed in it. Lord, we ask, Father, 
Help us to fulfill our calling this year. Let your purposes be fulfilled this year in our life. What you have called, what you have called for our life, let them be fulfilled this year. Lord, your calling is without revoking. And Lord, we ask that we would see a year of great and mighty things. Fulfillment. A year of victory. Lord, we will not succumb to the enemy. We will not succumb to the problem. We will not panic. We will not fear. We will not be intimidated. We will rise and we will fight the good fight. We will fight for our calling. We will fight for our victory. We will fight for our freedom. We will fight for our homes. We will fight for our nation. We will fight for our marriages. We will fight for our children. We will fight the good fight. Lord, we thank you that you've been, you have called us for victory. Every single one of us. Not one of us here has been called to failure. Everyone has been called to victory. Let it be so. We will take up the fight. We will, we will, Lord, take up the work. We will take up the calling. We will take up the rebuilding. We will take up and we will finish. And Lord, we praise you that there is nothing so strong as the Word of God. And we thank you, Lord, for your purposes. Lord, we commit this year into your hands and into your presence to dwell face to face more than ever before and dwell presence to presence more than ever before. And Lord, we just thank you right now. Our eyes are closed. If you need prayer, you'd like prayer, you're being called, you're being tugged, that you need prayer, you want someone to pray for you or to agree together for God's purposes on your life. We want to give you that chance. You like prayer for anything. The Bible says two or more can agree together shall be done. If it's God's will, it shall be done. You like prayer right now. Our hands, our, our, our eyes are closed. But right now, while our eyes are closed, those who want prayer, everybody who wants prayer, just lift up your hands. Just lift up your hands right now. God bless you all. God bless you all. All right, you can put your hands down. Now, those of you, you're here, you're not sure if you're saved, if you're born again, if you're in, if you're in God's will. Jesus said you have to be born again. doesn't matter if you're Catholic, Protestant, Jewish. You cannot be saved. You cannot enter heaven if you're not born again. The rest is religion, but you need to be born again no matter who you are. If you're not sure you are, you need to get in because ultimately it's either the, the end game is heaven or hell, eternal life or eternal judgment. And God gave everything, gave His life for you so you could be saved. He died for you, rose for you so you could be saved. But you need to get it. You need to have it. Take it. Right now, if you're not sure you're born again, or you're, or you're not sure you're saved, or you know you're not, born again or maybe you've been in God's you've known God but you haven't been in the center of what God has for you our hands are our, our our eyes are closed but right now it's just me right now just lift up your hands for the Lord just lift up your hands for the Lord that's you God bless you God bless you God bless you just lift up your hands last call that's you our eyes are still closed we want to give you a chance now to pray with somebody or have your questions answered so then if that's it, and if that's it, and if, and if it's your first time, if you're, you have questions about being born again, we not only will have somebody pray for you, but we'll also, we have some gifts for you. You'll get it. So you don't want to miss it. Our eyes are closed. But, and still stay in prayer, everybody. But everyone who, everyone who prayed, who said, yes, I'd like prayer, plus the ministers, all the ministers right now who are going to pray, I want you right now to just slip out of your seats. Just slip out. And everybody, nobody's looking. Just slip out of your seats. Come down to the side here. Come up to the side. you got some people going to pray for you. They're, they're going to pray for you right here. Don't miss it. God has something for you. Don't miss it. Just come come forward. Just slip out. You can bring friends with you. It's okay. Just slip out and come up. And if you have questions about being born again, just come up right now.